Well, thank you for um, the invitation, I guess, we're a sponsor, so. Um, as you see, again, this is a tag team um, effort between myself, I'm in the um, uh, National Infectious Diseases Service in the Veterans Health Administration Central Office, and my colleague, Ola Kowalski, um, is Deputy Director for Healthcare Engineering. And um, we're representing VA together because of the multidisciplinary nature of Legionella prevention. Okay. We're gonna ask for a very practical assessment from the committee on what we can do to prevent Legionnaire's disease in our veteran population. And are we doing the right things to do that? Um, so can there be consensus on best practices for the practical application of what we know or what do we need to know about risk assessment and prevention activities in buildings, and I want to stress buildings because we have vast healthcare systems, we're not the only ones, there's multiple buildings on a campus, and you'll see different things in different buildings on one campus. And so implementation is really at a building level, and how do we know what to do um, for each building? We have a different perspective than the other sponsors in that we implement practices um, in buildings. This is not um, overarching or theoretical, I guess is the way I'd put it. And that's why you'll see for our presentation, we'll be focusing on how we actually use what, what's out there. So I'll give a bit of background on uh, the Veterans Health Administration itself, the history of uh, Legionella prevention in VHA, um, it's a long history. And then um, our current VHA policy. Um, we'll go over the major components, but what I really wanna get to is what are the areas of general agreement that drove the policy? But more importantly, what were the challenges we faced when deciding of all the information out there, what are we going to do? Uh, and then I will highlight for each section um, what we have in VHA policy. Um, and I'll be doing um, the discussion on the environmental, microbiological aspects, clinical aspects, and Ola will be doing uh, the discussion on the engineering aspects. Our summary will then be, of course, giving a little bit more specifics on why we feel the need for this study. So the Veterans Health Administration is the largest integrated healthcare system in the US. We provide healthcare, um, to America's veterans. Uh, we serve over 9 million veterans each year. And we have a large network of facilities in every state and in territories in the US. Um, we have 170 medical centers, 134 community living centers. These are um, long-term care facilities, sometimes standalone, sometimes associated with a medical center. 48 domiciliaries, these are um, residential rehabilitation programs and then a number of community clinics, um, ambulatory surgical care centers. We're everywhere. And we have a unique perspective then on some of the information that, for example, CDC sees nationally from um, non-VA hospitals. We have an ability to look at Legionnaire's disease across uh, a, on a national perspective from one healthcare system but we're also responsible for preventing Legionnaire's disease on a national scale, a number of different um, healthcare systems. Those 170 medical centers, um, I don't want you to get the impression that we're only implementing this in 170 buildings. Our policy actually is implemented in over 600 buildings. So we have a long history of um, Legionella prevention policy in VHA, starting um, back in 1985. Some of the policy in the early years was related to scald prevention. So that's around the time that um, that really was um, a, a major issue. And often, you know, of course that goes hand in hand. You want to have high water temperatures to prevent Legionella growth, but then you can't scald your patients. And how do you balance those risks? 
So over the years, you'll see we updated um, our policy a number of times. What I'll point out is in 2008, a lot of the history was with, as I said, water temperature regulation. In 2008, we um, published a policy, this is required uh, directive for risk assessment for the first time for Legionella. And this included options for environmental testing for Legionella in the water, clinical testing of patients, but trying to understand if you need to do something to prevent disease. Um, and then in 2012, we did also prohibit um, decorative water features indoors in all our facilities. The current directive is VHA Directive 1061. It was published in August of 2014. It's publicly available at, at this web link. And it pertains to the prevention of Legionella, healthcare associated Legionella disease in buildings with overnight stays. So these would be whether there are long-term care residents or acute care patients or visitors. Um, we have a number of Fisher houses, which are like Ronald McDonald houses. So those of them are under the purview of the directive as well. There were challenges in, in developing this policy. At, at the time that we were already revising it, our policies generally get revised every five years. At the time we were revising the previous policy, there was a large outbreak of Legionnaires disease at a VA facility. And this garnered a lot of external attention and input and expectations on VA. There was scant recent guidance at the time. ASHRAE 188 was not yet published. Um, and the focus on primary prevention from other um, agencies was, was not um, recent. And there was lack of consensus and even controversy on what to do. A lot of the information is from outbreak reports and how that translates to primary prevention um, wasn't really clear. There's differences in regulations and guidelines and standards international, whether should you do water testing or not proactively. And these are the things that um, we think it would be beneficial for the committee to look at. What are the different guidelines in different places, in Europe, in Australia? Are there data to show how those standards and guidelines are um, affecting Legionnaires disease rates? And then expert opinions. There's a number of them. All you know, very knowledgeable, but with different perspectives and ideas on what is required, the minimum requirements, what's necessary. Mm -hmm. I'll mention here um, hazard analysis and critical control point, HACCP. Um, that comes up a lot. Some are in favor of it, some are not. And when we're trying to take what's out there and different opinions um, that came up even during a strategy workshop that we had to develop policy at the time, it, trying to boil down the different opinions into a policy document was difficult. There, is not, there was not consensus. Each individual felt there was, <laughs> but put together, not so much. And then the scope of the prevention needs. Um, we focused on potable water because that's what we could handle um, at the time to make sure that a policy was released um, so that uh, we could have updated prevention policy in the most um, at-risk uh, setting. Inpatient versus outpatient. Our, our policy focused on inpatient, again, because of the most at-risk setting. What really is the burden of Legionnaire's disease from the outpatient setting? I don't know that we know. I can tell you from our internal surveillance that there are cases of Legionnaires disease that have had outpatient visits in the 10 days prior to symptom onset, but we don't know what kind of follow-up was done, say, by the local health department when those cases are reported as to what other exposures there were. And so do healthcare systems have to have policies akin to the inpatient setting for outpatient dock-in-the-box type clinics? 
Um, leased versus owned buildings, and this is something that you know I won't get into here, but it's something that with with um, other standards that are now coming out or have come out, how do you handle this? Um, issue of your patients coming to a building where you don't actually own and manage the water system. I don't know that that's in the scope of the committee, but when we're trying to put policy together, that was a really um, uh, important point to try to uh, address. And so our policy is for VHA owned buildings. And importantly, the burden of healthcare associated Legionnaires disease was largely uncharacterized. CDC did come out with their vital signs um, last year, which was one of the largest looks at healthcare associated Legionnaires disease in the US. We know that healthcare systems are um, important for prevention practices because we have, have um, patients who are at higher risk. But what is the burden of Legionnaires disease in the US that's from healthcare exposure? I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a few slides. So this is our directive, and the, as I mentioned, this was published prior to ASHRAE 188. There had been drafts um, that, ha that were um, out for public review at the time, and it's based on the concepts in, in that document. Um, so every facility has to have a facility water safety committee, and a written plan. I think this committee is one of the most important aspects of the new policy, of, of this policy when it came out. Because of the importance of communication between entities, clinical and engineering and environmental, that don't often get an opportunity to speak with each other. Engineering controls, um, Ola will be speaking about those, implementation of biocide and water temperature to reduce Legionella. Um, it's a primary prevention directive, not a secondary prevention directive. But how do we know the controls are working? We require both clinical validation, meaning are you testing patients with pneumonia to make sure you don't have an issue, and environmental validation. Are you testing your water for Legionella to see if the controls are reducing the hazard you're trying to prevent? And then responding to the validation um, um, data that you're seeing. So we'll go through each one of these and separately and talk about some of the challenges um, when we were deciding what aspects and how much do we need to implement um, in this directive. All right, so the Water Safety Committee and Written Prevention Plan. There's pretty much general agreement on these concepts. Um, the committee needs to be multidisciplinary leadership, engineering, infectious disease. One thing I would point out, I think there's an assumption that because healthcare facilities have infection prevention control um, programs, then um, they should have Legionella risk assessment all under control. There's a difference between prevention of this healthcare associated infection and a lot of the other HAIs MRSA, C. diff that are transmitted person to person, that type of thing, there really needs to be engineering involved as well. Infection prevention control should not be necessarily experts um, in, in facilities. Um, but the other aspect also is to generalize what we're doing at VA, something to think about, some places may not have these entities. You know, long-term care settings, smaller long-term care facilities may not have infection prevention control. And so when these things go out about having teams and such, um, the ability to implement the practices that are being put forward may be challenging if um, certain people aren't, aren't involved or can't be involved. We do require a written prevention, a uh, Legionella prevention plan, and it's a building level plan. So you may have a campus that has five buildings that fall under the purview of the directive. You can have an overarching campus policy, but you need to have a written prevention plan for each building. And in that document, in, uh, including requirements and actions, is also the Legionella um, risk assessment. It should be an annual risk assessment at least. So doing a risk assessment for Legionnaires disease. 
model non-traditional infection prevention and control risk assessments, right? This happens all that this is this is the bread and butter of infection control is doing risk assessments. Looking at the occupants, exposure risks, your ability to implement the controls, and then in this case for this disease, have you had past cases of healthcare associated Legionnaire's disease? And this should factor into um, how you do your risk assessment. But when you look at the details, one of the challenges is, is are you identifying your Legionnaire's disease cases to know that you actually have an issue? I would think, I think at, in healthcare that often doesn't happen. And when you say ability to implement control practices, what com control practices are most important to monitor and to keep in check for informing risk. Some buildings may have biocide levels out of whack. They're not seeing Legionella in their water. Other buildings may have pretty tight control of the um, biocide at the tap and they're still finding Legionella. And is that even the right thing to, to monitor? I think again, when you get to, when you look at a building level, we have a phrase in the VA. When you've seen one VA, you've seen one VA. I can tell you, when you've seen one VA building, you've seen one VA building. Any combination of things happening with biocide and temperature and Legionella in the water, we, we see. And, and then stratification of risk based on environmental data. I mentioned that we require um, Legionella testing. What do you do with the results? Does detection of Legionella in water correlate with higher healthcare associated Legionnaires disease in that building? I don't know that we have that answer, but that's what I'd ask the committee to look at. What do environmental Legionella results mean and how, do, how can they best be used? It, and what about species? Should we be looking for all Legionella, Legionella pneumophila? What correlates with helping us understand when we need to do something. So I'm gonna switch now to um, the next component in the directive is the um, engineering controls. Thank you. Um, so in terms of engineering controls, we know there's some uh, from the research we, were, we did and uh, looking at guidance policies, uh, both, and uh, codes, regulations, both national and international. Uh, we came to the assessment that uh, there was some level of consensus on primary controls, and that's temperature and uh, biocide residuals. Our challenges uh, were, were relatively numerous in coming up with, with a policy. Um, for complex and aging infrastructure. So we have, in terms of our the, the complexity of our infrastructure, we have everything from going from a, a tower hospital in the middle of a metropolitan city block to a sprawling campus encompassing several hundred acres and scores of buildings. You know, that's the environment that we function in. Our infrastructure age, uh, whereas the typical age uh, of healthcare infrastructure is, is a bit over 12 years, 12 to, 50, uh, 12 to 15 years uh, across the country. VAs is over 55. That's our healthcare infrastructure. We are well over 55 years on the average age of our buildings. Some of our buildings actually date back to the late 1860s. Go back. Right. Patient safety, certainly um, skull prevention is significant uh, for, for the age of the population we have. We know that uh, the uh, population age has an impact on the uh, ability for, 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 for scalding. We also have uh, spinal cord veterans which uh, because of their injuries also lose sensitivity. So with that, there's, there's a heightened awareness of the potential for skull because of loss of sensitivity, the, the, thin, the thinning of skin tissues uh, due to injuries or age, all those things that may not be in a general population. 
we have that concentrated in our facilities. Oops. Biofilm, I don't think I need to say much more about that. Water quality. Now, when I talk about water quality, from our aspect, a lot of it is incoming source water quality. Because what we get in, have in the building is really a, significantly impacted from our perspective of the, the quality of the water that we are receiving from, from the source, whether it's the municipality or whether it's in some, in some cases we have some facilities that we are our own water supplier. Uh, a few of those, but mostly we receive municipal generated water. And uh, over the years, we, we have looked at that and we have highly variable uh, water quality coming in. Everything from pH, uh, temperature, and uh, biocide levels, where some of those actually approach not, almost non-detectable levels by the time they, they even reach our campus or even our buildings. So, so water quality is certainly a factor. Resiliency. So <clears throat> unlike some healthcare in institutions, we are charged as a, as, the, as a federal agency to also be in a position where we can support the community in times of disaster and need, which places a higher burden on us from that perspective. Whether it's a natural disaster or a man-made disaster, we have that additional burden, and I'll get into that just a little bit later in those implications. A water conservation, low flow fixtures, you know, use less water, less water flow. Less, you know, so the less water moves, more stagnation, more stagnation, you have temperature effects, and you have uh, degradation of biocide residuals. All those come into play. Along with that, the ma federal mandates for energy reduction. Certainly there are things we can do if water's coming in to a facility, which some of our facilities over summer will receive incoming municipal water in the 80s. That's the cold water that they're receiving. Now, we could turn around and say, we're gonna cool it because we know that water passes below a certain temperature inhibits uh, the growth of Legionella. But is that practical? Are we going to cool all the water coming into a building? We're going to refrigerate it, cool it. So th those, those are factors in there as well. Also the extent of implementation. We recognize that there are geographical location implications. We also know that even there are building implications and even within a building, whether, it, whether it's remodeled, whether there's, a, there's additions, even the same building may have different micro ecosystems within it. So all those things, we, we try to account for in, in, in generating this policy. So in uh, August of 2014, the, uh, our policy was published and it essentially established the principles both for physical infrastructure and operations. Uh, both clinical and infrastructure operations. So it wasn't just the physical build, but also how we're operating that facility. And also for the, from the clinical perspective, as Shanti had talked about. Along with that, uh, a few months later, we published a companion document, plumbing design manual, which elaborated on some of the details not really covered in the, in the policy. And both those documents need to be looked at in concert because they, they, they complement each other. So where policy and fundamentals are established within the directive, some of the details and execution pieces of how do you actually build, construct, design the facilities, what's needed in there, you know, you know what are the requirements for, for a temperature balancing valve, for a fixture, the flows, all those other pieces are contained in the plumbing design guide. So one piece I did want to talk about that's a little bit different is the aspect of resiliency. So where a facility may have a feed coming into it, we basically go in and say, we're we need to have redundancies, which as far as redundancies, that affects water flow. It affects how much piping is there. So now we're putting a loop on the entire campus to feed buildings. 
that magnifies the piping, that, that certainly magnifies the quantity of devices that, that are associated that, uh, which, which may or may not be reservoirs for uh, harboring growth, sediment, all those other issues that go along with that. Not only do we have the resiliency need for uh, the campus, we also have resiliency need for critical mission critical buildings. So now we're, we're having it added, adding another layer of redundancy and complexity to the whole structure. And each service entrance feed ha is supposed to, or is required to basically handle the entire capacity of each building. So the water flows that would be, if I only had one, are reduced by essentially in half if they're properly balanced. But then, so I'm affecting water velocities, flows, sediment buildup, all these other factors that start coming into play are affected by just the, just the aspect, the one aspect of resiliency that we have that, that is not necessarily throughout healthcare. So one other aspect that we did require is the measurement, the, the, the assessment of incoming water. And that's not just coming to the campus, it's incoming to each building. As Shantani has mentioned, you know, you know, a building, uh, we see high variability in each building. So as part of that, it was to understand what is the incoming water to each building. Uh, so we required a number of different things, both for temperature, dissolved solids, kind of as a surrogate for what are the contaminants, whether it be they are organic or inorganic contaminants within the water, pH, oxygen, uh, oxygen residual and water pressure. Uh, having that information will, would inform the local committee as water safety committee in terms of what controls and if there's a variance from a norm, you know, what action may be needed. So if I drop water pressure, and, if, and in this uh, diagram, they're on the other side of the uh, reducing pressure valves. Well, and, and if the building has its own, a, a reservoir, which many of ours, ours do have a reservoir tank, it will ne they won't necessarily know that water pressure is dropped. It's reinstituted again, and you, you're going to disturb sediment. You may disturb some bioflow, all these issues. So, it, so an indicator. Uh, the same thing for changes in uh, pH and temperature. Uh, some of our facilities have incoming water at pH is over 8.5, but yet the municipal choice of water treatment is chlorination. So, and we know that at that level, it's not as effective as it would be at a lower pH. So, so part of that is looking at that, and we know that that also varies over time pressure. So <clears throat> we're looking at being able to provide the water safety, the local water safety committee information to be able to react to external, not just internal, but also external changes. So the primary control methods, as I had mentioned before, uh, water temperature. So we've got for hot water. Uh, I'm not going to go through all those. Uh, we did increase. Uh, we had 120 degrees Fahrenheit before. We did increase under the uh, revised policy directive going to 124 from 120. Uh, a little bit more higher into the uh, kill range that we had before. Uh, cold water. We addressed cold water as well. We're, and now we set that as, in lieu of a requirement, we set that as a goal. It's much harder to achieve. Uh, cold water, uh, nobody really recirculates cold water. Hot water you do uh, to, to a, a large extent in codes, but cold water recirculation. But also the other compounding factor is I could lower the temperature. I'm not necessarily killing the organism. So that in itself is not a requirement from, from that perspective because, you know, while we may in some instances re reduce the growth in the system, we won't necessarily eradicate it or, or make it ineffectual. Biocide uh, required residual monitoring, both on the incoming side and also within the building. And then supplemental treatment, uh, went into those as, as far as if needed as well. Some additional controls, 
flushing. So we mandated flushing for low flow and low use fixtures in order to mitigate the effects of, of water stagnation. Scald prevention. Introduce thermos, mandatory thermostatic balancing valves in all lo locations, not just where we had before in tubs and showers for immersion, but also in sink faucets as well. So that was really the extension there because we, we raised the temperature. So the, the 110 degrees actually comes from the uh, limits on the international plumbing code of 110 degrees. So for our environment. So if we're circulating 124, how do I prevent 124 degree water coming out the faucet when, when a person's washing their hands? And as I, again, as I said, we have a population, a, a quite a, a large component of those do, does not have the temperature sensitivity. So they may be, so they won't necessarily readily feel and adjust the water temperature to a colder water temperature. Dead lakes. So that's in literature and other places, but not really well defined. So what we ended up doing is we, we defined for our policy and our purposes what we deem to be a dead lake. So uh, essentially the allowable for us became two pipe diameters from the, from the main or the branch that it's coming off of. Um, from a circula circulation perspective, mixing of water in there to reconstitute or, or re-add re uh, biocide in there, maintain temperatures, had to limit in there. Uh, we required identification of dead lakes in, in, existing, in the existing systems. A risk assessment, both from a f physical and from a clinical environmental perspective. Removal. A prioritized removal. Can't necessarily remove all of it at once. So the highest risk ones needed to be prior priority for removal. And also the most easily accessible ones. Dead legs buried in walls or in floors certainly aren't going to, until you're doing major renovation, may not have access to those to remove. And then the, the, third, the last piece is prevention. So not only in terms of prevention of new designs, so I'm building a new building, I'm putting up a new wing, I'm re doing ma major remodeling, putting in new piping installation, but along with that, prevention in terms of, I'm gonna decommission this sink because this exam room is no longer gonna be an exam room. It's gonna be converted to an office. So I'm gonna take what prior to that happened was, okay, so they take the thing off, they, they cap the piping in the wall. But that 20, 30, 40, 50 feet, whatever it was, was, was left and remained because it, it was easier to do. Now we require that removal, going back to the main and capping that. Uh, the other definition was where we, we, we switched a little bit is in terms of fixture and out. And basically that's the distance of piping between the main and the fixture. So that, you know, where we have a recirculation loop, a loop or others to maintain temperature, water flow and all of that. We moved from a fixed length as in a number of codes and other aspects, 25, 50 feet, uh, wherever, depending upon what you are, what the literature you're looking at, regulation or code, uh, they vary by state. Some states say 25 feet, others say 50, others don't have a limit. So we moved from that because we recognize that a half inch diameter water pipe certainly has much less water in it than an inch and a quarter, inch and a half, or two inch. So, so we factored that in there. And, we, and also along with that, looking at the use and the type of fixture we're gonna be doing. So if in an environment, we limited that as well in order to ensure that there's turnover, an appropriate turnover. So if we look at a, a, a shower, gonna, somebody's gonna use the shower, use it for several minutes, there's gonna be a fair amount of flow in there both for flushing and replenishment of any biocide uh, into the water. Now, on the other hand, you look, you look at, at, at public uh, restrooms. Go in there, especially with the automatic faucets, maybe in there, you know, they're, they're, we're required to use low flow fixtures, 
and then some the, the how how often somebody uses it and for what duration, how long are they washing their hands is relatively short. So, so we accounted for that. And as you, as you can see, there's a difference in, in being able to do that. We incorporated and looked at the type of fixture, its utilization, and also, also the piping, what the volume of the water is. So we moved from that then, then a straight number and saying, well, we're gonna allow 50 feet, 25 feet, because we're looking for re re reduction of stagnation. We're looking for re replenishment of biocide in the water. We're also looking for restoration of temperature to the greatest extent possible. Some additional controls, basically aerators, no more aerators. Um, from, from the standpoint of reducing the aerosolization risk. So we know that's prevalent and in, in common in industry. Um, everything is lamer flow devices that, that we require, whether it is in a inpatient or an outpatient setting in, in our facilities. Drain piping. So while pr primary controls focus on the domestic water supply, we also had needed to take a look and saying, what are the implications on the, on the waste side? So looking at thermal eradication as, as a means uh, with, with a shift in acceptance by building codes of PVC piping, that's not sustainable. So we, we reverted back to under, under certain conditions and requirements uh, to go back to cast iron piping so that so we could accommodate sustained and prolonged thermal eradication. Our buildings, it's not just one or two clinics, one or two exam rooms, they're fairly substantial number. And if you, if you end up having to do a ward, an area, a floor, or a multitude of floors, or even the entire building, of, and trying going through and doing thermal eradication versus another treatment, that plastic PVC piping will deform. Point of use filtration. So we acknowledge point of use filtration. We recommend it in certain applications, uh, really intended to be temporary service. Uh, if you test water and you find Legionella under our normal sur surveillance processes, that you know that's an option if you need to want to continue with that versus turning off the water supply to a, to a particular room or an area. You can put in filters. A number of our facilities utilize that technique while they, uh, until such time as they do an eradication or mitigation of uh, Legionella in that area. Or that, and, uh, and then once we're done, you know, that's also been mentioned before uh, earlier today, we culture. How do you know that that was successful? Then we cultured. People have got to wait 10 days, possibly two weeks to get the results back. In the meantime, do you take rooms out of service or do we just put filters on? So it, it, from a practical aspect, turn around and we'll put filters on those. You know, we, you know there's a certain census, patients are there, we have to take care of them. Uh, where, where do you put them? So we'll put filters in, in using those. Also the aspect of using filters for exceptionally high risk populations. In some instances, marrow transplants, uh, other types of transplants we have, uh, although not as prevalent perhaps in the VA, but we do have instances where patients do go into that kind of an environment. You know, they're going to be given sterile water to drink. I mean, a variety of things. So this is an extra measure of safety, rather, you know, uh, in, into their environment. In terms of construction, repairs, and alterations. One of the additional aspects is we require disinfection. So while it's accepted practice to do piping disinfection for underground installations, it isn't really widespread practice to do that for in-building installations. So we're typically, it's just they install it in the building, they'll flush any debris out, turn it on, it's fine, it's good to go. Well, we, we added the, an extra aspect of if, if, the, if there's contamination in the piping, we certainly don't want to introduce it into the building. 
And then in terms of emergency re remediation, thermal eradication, many are familiar with that. Uh, shock chlorination, we use the term. Uh, some may know that as hyperchlorination, but because we introduced the aspect of disinfection, which in itself kind of meets, somewhat meets the definition of hyper, we wanted to differentiate from hyperchlorination that's, that's used fairly often in the industry to the aspect of we're calling that shock and we're calling disinfection. Uh, so that we did stratify that it's two different levels and we do have facilities that have gone through hyperchlorination shock chlorination uh, several times and they're still coming back with positives so that in itself flushing they've tried a number of different things you know once twice you know then then we recommend for them to go and say you know what go the disinfection route you know, for for existing piping in your, in your building, and usually that's uh, after that uh, when the sampling is done, the cultures usually will come back negative. Not the first thing we recommend, but it but it is there uh, as an option. At this point, I'll turn it back over to Shantin. So that's a lot to, I guess I'll, I'll back from my perspective as a non-engineer, but I do, we do go on site visits to a lot of our facilities across the country for consultative assistance. Um, implementing all of that is challenging, um, sometimes in a building. And the question that comes to my mind is how much does every building need to do? Is, is every building a ticking time bomb waiting for a healthcare associated disease? Um, in the VA, based on some of our data, because of our um, clinical validation, our clinical work we've done in the last four years, most of our buildings are not associated, have not been associated with overnight healthcare um, Legionnaire's disease cases. Most of the cases we see are community cases or um, outpatient, you know, they had an outpatient visit in the 10 days before. Predominantly, we our cases are, um, we have about 3% of our cases were healthcare, definite healthcare associated. So these 600 buildings that are implemented, we're not saying we shouldn't do anything. We certainly have prioritized Legionnaire's disease prevention in the VA, and we don't want any of our veteran patients to get Legionnaire's disease. But is every building on the same scale of what they need to do, and can we understand that because that is a lot to implement um, maybe they all do need to do that and that's that's okay um, but can we know better so how do we know on a practical sense day to day if our um, policies in our if our policy in our building our, our plan is working as I mentioned we have to do clinical and environmental validation at all our um, buildings that that are under the purview of the directive so there's general agreement right, that if you know you had a case, you have a case of healthcare associated Legionnaire's disease going on that you just diagnosed, you may have other cases that you should take you, could, you should take actions to prevent um, more cases. But the challenges for implementing clinical validation are actually identifying who who should be tested. Is it every single healthcare associated pneumonia case? It, it could be. But identifying healthcare associated pneumonia is complicated. Um, in general, in the US, uh, there is no whole house surveillance for healthcare associated pneumonia. There used to be back in the day. That's really not done um, as much now. And healthcare associated pneumonia is often treated empirically. I'll bring up the um, issue of aspiration pneumonia. For example, aspiration pneumonia is you know, pretty common. It's often not thought to be caused by Legionella. It's usually, you know, mouth microbes that you aspirate down into your lungs. It's not treated with antibiotics that are effective against Legionella often. Um, we've found that actually aspiration pneumonia can be caused by Legionella. I, is, I would think in, in the country there may be a lot of underdiagnosis of Legionnaire's disease because aspiration pneumonia is often not tested. Does that mean that every aspiration pneumonia should be tested? I don't think that we're going to find that Legionella is the primary cause of aspiration pneumonia. So who gets tested? 
these are resources, you know, there's, there's management. Um, it's, it's kind of a tricky question. Diagnostic testing, this was covered um, by CDC. Um, mostly urine antigen uh, is used, but it only diagnoses LP1. Um, clinical culture can be difficult to do because it's difficult to get specimens. And then rapid molecular tests, this is where I'd like to see things go. PCR, it, it's not uh, FDA approved right now, um, so it's not standardized, it's novel, but um, it would be nice to see an ability to rapidly diagnose the spectrum of uh, Legionella cases that, that could be out there. And then what to do about possible healthcare associated um, Legionnaire's disease. The um, CDC Legion Analysis Case Report Form, uh, which I think Laura had, had referred to before, does um, include outpatient exposure um, on as what could be considered possible healthcare associated Legionnaire's disease um, for a system that then has prevention activities tied to identification of cases, as we do, because if you identify a case of Healthcare says a Legionnaire's disease, you need to do something. If it's a possible case, possible meaning they spent a portion of the 10 days prior to symptom onset at, a v, at the VA facility, they should test the area where the patient was to see if there's, um, if there's Legionella. In the outpatient setting, um, that that often doesn't result in an identification of Legionella or there's primary um, exposure outside the VA that we're depending on, on um, local health departments to look up. There's not a lot of information out there on what, what activities should be done when there's an outpatient um, healthcare associated Legionella disease. Inpatient um, possible exposures, how many cases trigger actions? Um, in the VA, any case of possible inpatient um, healthcare associated Legionnaire's disease triggers an environmental assessment um, to see if Legionella is there. I believe CDC recommendation is two in six months. Is that correct? Eight, 12 two in 12 months. We've had the situation where one case was investigated, Legionella was identified in the water, and it matched to, we actually had a clinical isolate, which was rare, and it matched and it converted to a definite case. It was actually a unique SBT. Um, and so we would argue that any possible inpatient um, should, be, should be investigated. So our policy highlight that, that I'd mentioned here is, if you look in that, uh, the document, it's a heightened awareness for LD testing. If you've identified a case of possible or definite healthcare associated Legionnaire's disease, be on heightened awareness testing any healthcare associated pneumonia you identify for LD. Since we require environmental testing, if you find Legionella on routine testing in your hospital, be on heightened awareness for testing healthcare associated pneumonias for Legionella. Data that we have um, in two years, for the two years we have data for that we've analyzed, the VA system has done almost 50,000 UATs. Our percent positivity rate is 0.6, very low. Are we over testing? Perhaps. Are we capturing healthcare associated Legionnaires disease? I think probably better than a lot of systems. But it does indicate that there's a lot of cases that aren't LP1, right? And um, clinical culture, we've done over 6,000. And I think there were 13 positive, something to that effect. So, you know, we, we're very aware of healthcare associated lesions. I was telling Laura at the break, I hope those weren't VA clinicians who were saying they'd never heard of Legionella before. <laughs> um, environmental validation. There's general agreement that there's Legionella in some buildings, in, in some healthcare buildings. What do you do about it? This is a tricky one. 
There is lack of consensus on whether you even should do routine water testing or not um, to indicate that there's risk. What protocol do you, what locations do you test? Do you test hot water, cold water? Um, how often do you test? Processing protocols, how do you select a laboratory to do the environmental testing? We don't recommend that our clinical labs do environmental testing. It's two different animals, so to speak. Um, the detection methodology used, it was raised about molecular methods versus culture methods. Our policy requires culture at the time. That's what, um, uh, with, with the CDC lab, uh, lab, the elite lab system, we used our partners to provide some methodology, to, some, some mechanism to, to find a, a laboratory that could do the testing. What types of Legionella do you focus on? Just Legionella pneumophila, since that causes most disease in this country, as far as we know, or any Legionella, because comments have been made that if you have any Legionella growing, it's indicative that LP could grow as well. Is that true? Um, which should we focus on? And then interpretation of results. What limit of detection do we use to determine if something is positive? What is the accuracy of quantification? My understanding is not so good. Um, I'll show you some, some data. Strain virulence. Is there a way that we can, and it was discussed by CDC, is there a way that we could stratify risk and understand what's in our um, system and whether it will cause disease based on strain virulence, and then reliability in results. Our policy is that we require all hospitals that have or facility uh, buildings under the previous directive to do quarterly environmental testing. I, this is a complicated, I, I just want to get across the point. This, this is, um, a poster at ID VA hospital, and I have the link on the, on the slide. This is a hospital, they were doing their quarterly testing, they switched labs, they, they were using one CDC elite certified lab, they switched labs, and all of a sudden they were having Legionella in their water system, they hadn't before. And there was enough question to make them wonder, is it the lab? We, of course, are always saying, no, it's not the lab, you have to do stuff. Well, they, they did an, a little experiment and they sent split samples to four different CDC elite certified labs. And they got four, including um, standards that, that were made at their laboratory. You can see that one found Legionella in negative control. One, lab four actually did a pretty good job with quantifying um, the standards. Different ones found different um, um, Legionella, whether it was Legionella or not, in the test samples, which were just water samples from their facility. We act on positive Legionella from our environmental sampling. Should we be if this is the reliability in environmental sampling? Can there be better? Um, is CDC elite, is that pro, I mean, I know there's changes coming and, and that type of thing, but can we have a better understanding of how to select labs and how to interpret the results that we get? So then what do you do with your environmental results? There's not much agreement here. Should detection of Legionella trigger action? Um, and when? Is it, um, concentration of Legionella, uh, if you have 100 CFU per mil or not? Is it a percent of positive outlets? Is it any time you detect Legionella? Um, and, and which Legionella? Is it just Legionella pneumophila or um, any, any species? And then what do you do when you've reached an action limit? Well, what type of remediation? Is it just flushing? Is it actual thermal eradication or hypochloridation? The extent? Can you even implement? You know, if you do thermal eradication and you have mixing valves in place, can you actually implant, implement thermal eradication? Effects on the infrastructure? Effects on other microbes? You know, we, we focus on Legionella with this policy, 
So what are we doing in the infrastructure um, with, with, with the remediation that we're doing? And then the communication of the results. Internally and externally, VA, you know, there are, there are entities, some, some, sometimes media will pick up um, our, our routine sampling results and, and publish that. And what does that, how do you communicate then what, what that means? Um, but also communication of the results to occupants and to employees and what kind of um, uh, messaging need, needs to go with that. So the policy highlight here um, really highlights an issue that we would like to see um, maybe looked at by, you know, by the committee, what, what best to do. Our previous BHA policy, that 2008 policy I mentioned, allowed a threshold percentage of positive results before action was necessary. Um, and it was getting to this concept that if you're noticing more and more Legionella, you're not under control. And if you reach a certain limit that you've set, do something. But it's sort of a long, an indication of a systems issue. Our current policy, the 1061, all Legionella muscle up positive outlets must be remediated. Um, and if you detect non-Legionella pneumophila, you have to test more outlets to see if Legionella pneumophila is there. Under the assumption, conservatively, that if Legionella are there, it may, be, may mean L pneumophila could be growing as well, if that's actually true. And then it's a graded response of how extensively in the building you need to remediate based on the number and location of positives. This was um, the basis for the change was really in the realm of that outbreak that I mentioned before. And um, at, at testimony, congressional testimony, it was indicated there's no known safe level of Legionella. And perhaps that's true for some, some buildings. Um, there's also, you know, the guy, if routine testing for Legionella is done, this is the 2003 Environmental Infection Control Guideline. Um, perform corrective measures aimed at maintaining undetectable levels. So then, of course, one of the options is, let's just not test. <laughs> if we don't look for it, then we don't have to do anything about it. And we won't know if there's a safe, you know, whether there's no known safe level or not. But that's really not what we felt was the right thing to do. Um, we already had policy that talked about testing the environment for Legionella and had, had found that that was helpful in understanding risk. But we also had direction from the public, from Congress, from our leadership, that thou shalt assess your, your water and, and um, not allow for the unsafe um, occurrence of Legionella in your water. And so that's where we were. It's a, it's a unique, perhaps, place to be, but I'd ask the committee to look at in this realm of the understanding of, the, of no known, or contention, I should say, of no known safe level, how do we implement a policy for that? So I'll summarize the last slide. So the need for the study. There is increased attention on Legionella prevention now. Unlike when we were developing the last policy, there are new standards, there's new, you know, new CMS requirements, what is the applicability and generalizability of each of those prevention practices that um, Ola talked about across buildings and how much do they need to do? You, I can tell you from the VA experience with the CMS memo, there's gonna be a whole lot more buildings wondering how much you know, do we need to do? It's, it's, it, are all buildings the same? So there's a need for a practical assessment of the state of the art based on current data and expert consensus on preventive measures. How much do, we, do buildings need to do? Is every healthcare building a ticking time bomb waiting for a case? I would, I would suggest not from our VA data, but how do we know which buildings we need to prioritize? We've seen large outbreaks of Legionnaire's disease from cooling towers when we know that there's Legionella in all sorts of cooling towers 
in epidemiology, I guess, with Legionella not being as high prevalent a disease, perhaps, as, as some others, it almost falls into that perfect storm kind of analogy you see, where a whole bunch of things come together and all of a sudden you have this outbreak of 100 cases, when we know that there's Legionella other places where it doesn't happen. What is that perfect storm? Can we understand that better to know where we need to focus our attention? I, meant, I talked about environmental validation and clinical diagnostics. Implementation science. Again, how do you method, assess the um, requirements on a building level? And what I think is really risk stratification. Is there a way, is there really no known safe level of Legionella from routine testing? Do you have to get rid of Legionella when you find it? Mo we've had buildings that have had Legionella and reduced it to sporadic findings now and then and have had a case. We have other buildings where they can, you know, they've had a real challenge dealing with Legionella. They find it routinely, never had a case, but they're doing heightened awareness for clinical testing. So I would say, is there a harmful level? There's maybe no known safe level. Is there a known harmful level? How can we tell from building to building? And this may come to the discussion CDC had earlier about variability in um, pathogenicity and strains. Is there a way, looking at building characteristics and microbial assessment, to be able to stratify risk um, on a more um, specific level? And of course, then the research questions and roadmap. What do we need to get there? What do we need to get there? The VA has a very conservative directive based on what the available data at the time, but then external factors. And can we get to a place where um, the science and data can inform how we assess our buildings on a more specific level? Thank you. I don't know that we, do we have time for questions? <laughs> so, um, we will run into our break a little bit, but I'd like to see if there's uh, one or two short questions, some concise, be very concise. Or did I summarize that perfectly? Joan, we do have a little bit of time because we don't have as many people signed up to the open mic schedule. Okay. So I think, you know, okay. uh, a few things are just very good. Okay. Um, let's bring the mic up so that people are not. And if before anyone asks a question, if you could state your name and oh, yeah. people in the morning. Yes, please, I forgot to say that. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Amy Pruden from Virginia Tech. Um, so, Ole, you mentioned point of use filters, but it was a bit brief. I was wondering if you've noticed them to be a, a, a problematic control point for Legionella. Well, in terms of point of use filters, uh, they're very time limited. Uh, most of the filters, depending upon you know, how much water flow, uh, water flow stops because they, they get clogged. So they require replacement. So they're, it, it's a maintenance headache from, from that perspective. So universally using them is, is completely impractical because of the resource. So it's going to go both in terms of procurement uh, you know, what they cost, but also in terms of changing them out. So it's not a practical application. You use them when you need to. And primarily, as I had mentioned uh, before, was if positives are found, oftentimes facilities use them in an interim not to close down uh, rooms from use to be able to keep uh, maintaining patient care. They'll put filters in. On, you know, if it's an inpatient room with a shower, they'll put you know, a filter on the shower, they'll put a fil filters on the faucets until such time as they do more testing if that's what's, what's, what's necessary. Uh, you know, if it was not the uh, MAFA-1 and then, then they're doing surrounding testing, they have to wait back for those. If those come back positive, negative, then they do, then there's the issue of now, now I plan or schedule, I can't just turn around and if I'm, do depending upon the extent of mitigation or remediation I'm doing in a hospital setting that is, or even a nursing home setting, that, that's a very involved process and planning. 
So th all that is time. So that so the application is: Do I do without the resource of the of the of the facility or the room, and then potentially turn patients away? And the answer is no. So you, you, you utilize them in that that aspect. Or if I have exceptionally high risk patients, uh, transplants, as others, that may be used as a re, as a secondary re, redundant point of of control. Um, it's a steep program from Seattle. Um, just a question. Within the VA system, I can imagine there are a number of different mitigation strategies that were in some hospitals in place, either chlorination, copper silver ion, et cetera. How has this policy sort of taken part of that into account because of the diversity of those approaches that have been taken? We don't um, mandate that any particular um, system be used, just that you have a bio, have biocide in the water such that, uh, at, at, that you're measuring it at the um, endpoints and use that in conjunction with your Legionella data. If you're continually finding Legionella in your routine testing and you need to, you, you just, and the facility, the local water, um, facility water committee determines that they need to implement a secondary treatment system, that is um, their decision on, on what to implement. Um, we really want to get to the, the idea of the validation work should help identify the needs for a particular building. Chantini, quick question on the uh, environmental testing you've been doing now yes. for the last, what, three or more years plus. Yes. Um, don't you have some data to indicate what sorts of concentrations you're finding in those waters, those environmental samples related to the uh, cases that you're investigating? So we have very few um, healthcare associated cases. You mean putting together clinical and environmental data? Is that what you mean? Well, your environmental investigation. Well, oh, yes. Um, for, so for possible healthcare associated cases, sometimes they do not find Legionella. Um, so you're talking about case investigations now, not, not primary um, environmental validation. There are times they don't find um, Legionella, just as with, I think, um, other investigations in, in the healthcare setting. We don't have jurisdiction to test other areas. Um, and there are times when they do. Most of the time in those cases, we don't have a clinical isolate to compare to. Um, but if they do find Legionella, then they have to remediate those areas. Um, I got, uh, two more quick questions, mm -hmm. I hope. One here, and, and then Michelle, you're going to get the last question. Just a, a quick question. Uh, first of all, I, I know the VA has done a great amount of work in really putting some of the most advanced systems. And so I think your discussion really kind of frames the challenge. With the environmental side, uh, what you, the, the recently in the news of the VA home in Quincy, you know, there's now certain look at the, the water side of that. What what is the process that is followed in, in that situation? In in Quincy particularly. Or anyone like that. So Qu Quincy is not a U.S. Federal Department of Veterans Affairs facility, so I can't speak to um, Quincy itself. Um, you know, this really, it's, it's, it's difficult to give an overarching answer for implementation. Um, we have had, we've had the situation where, you know, we've had a large outbreak, uh, extensive controls were put in place and not had a definite, you know, a, a case again. But we've also had the situation where systems have put in extensive uh, work to to prevent um, cases and have had a case. I mean, you you would look at what they did. You would go. We go in, um, not you know, consultative. We go in and and they're doing the things that are outlined in the plan, and still had this case. And so, it'd be nice to understand what was what was missing there. It, not that we're going to eradicate Legionnaire's disease from our system, probably. I'd love to do that. 
but when can we know? I, I, I did want to also build on that for something I didn't mention. The no known safe level may be something, you know, certain facilities that have repeated cases have to do more, perhaps, and they may need to take the approach of no known safe level. But what about the facilities that routinely find Legionella and they're working to reduce that? They're not having cases. Do they need to obliterate Legionella every time? Last question. So, um, in looking at all the uh, many actions you've taken, I just wanted to ask you whether you've looked at uh, specifically at any modifications of the systems for energy recovery that may influence quite a bit mm -hmm. uh, water quality in your hot water systems. I'm not exactly sure. In, ter in terms of re recovery, I mean, our if, if you're, we're talking about a hot water system, we, the water comes in, we heat it, there really isn't a recovery for that. Uh, we, okay. And in terms of any re heat recovery type systems or reuse like gray water um, okay. systems, and uh, we keep them expressly isolated. We do not mix them in, in, in terms of patient care areas. So no mixing of overheated water, for example, with, not, with water from the recycle, or which is done quite frequency we, we don't mix recycled water Ever. I mean I mean I well if the water is too hot coming out of a heat exchanger or, or whatever the, the heating source is then it will be tempered down by adding perhaps colder water to the system before through a mixing valve but always cold but, water. Yeah. well well cold water whatever unheated water Okay. in the building so if we have water coming i mean i wouldn't necessarily consider 85 degree water as being necessarily cold but some of our facilities in certain in, in the south uh get very extremely uh warm water uh during the summer months uh just because of you know the, the how how they're piped and the municipality around them the building is air conditioned but the water coming in is e either shallow shallow in the in the ground because there's no no freeze element uh or it's above ground and then all the uh any any re reservoirs or tanks are above ground that get heated 24 7. Okay. i think this Thank you. goes to the complexity of yeah. these different buildings and different systems and all the engineering questions that are are going to be of interest uh, to the committee thank you very much my